Well, there is an old story, an old, old story about a king who once ruled in the region of Lydia. He had the great honor, the great privilege to receive a favor from one of the Greek gods. As the story goes, a teacher named Selenius, who was the teacher of Dionysius, uh, wandered into the mortal realm because he had had too much wine. He met King Midas, and uh, Midas cared for him for several days and then returned him to Dionysius. Dionysius was so grateful that his teacher was back home and in his proper place that he offered King Midas a gift of whatever he wished in return. So Midas, who had long been tempted by the power of wealth, asked for the famous golden touch. And he said, I wish that whatever I touch would instantly turn into gold. And his wish was, of course, granted. And uh, Midas was astonished and thrilled to find out that if he touched a stick, he was suddenly holding a stick made entirely of pure and fine gold. He went through his rose garden and touched each of his roses and was delighted to have these beautifully formed golden roses. Then he went into his dining hall and he tried to eat. And he found out that the golden touch wasn't such a blessing after all. Right? And as the story goes, he then starved to death, wasting away because you can't eat a solid gold apple or a solid gold anything else. Now, I tell you this story because Midas's great temptation, his greatest desire, turned out to be his downfall and his undoing. It turned out to be a great curse. And this classic story reminds us of the dangers of giving in to our temptations. Midas, you see, was tempted by wealth and gold. He thought there would be nothing better than literally having the power to make money at your fingertips, right? At, just at his fingertips, he could touch and make all sorts of money. Um, in one version of this story, he accidentally turns his daughter into solid gold. Now, this is a temptation that obviously ended up causing him immense pain and immense loss. This story has been around so long that it's possible that even Jesus and his disciples could have heard it. It was recorded first by the poet named Ovid, uh, who lived during the time of Augustus Caesar. And you remember from the two uh, when the Jesus' Christmas birth story starts in the days of Caesar Augustus, right? So this story has been around a really long time. But I don't think Jesus needed the story of King Midas to tell his disciples how difficult and dangerous temptations can be. You see, temptations to sin are all around, and they surround us and overwhelm us sometimes. There's a prayer that I've seen in various places. I've gotten it forwarded through emails. I've seen it on Facebook. I've seen it in various places. Uh, it says this, Dear Lord, today... So far, I've done it all right. I haven't gossiped. I haven't lost my temper. I haven't been greedy or grumpy or nasty or selfish or overindulgent. Or overindulgent and I'm really grateful for that. But in a few minutes, Lord, I'm about to get out of bed. And from then on, I'm going to need a lot more help. <laughs> And this prayer sort of gets at it, doesn't it? <laughs> and all day long, from the moment you get out of bed, there are all sorts of temptations uh, that pull us away from the things that we ought to do. And very often, just like King Midas, we find that the things that we thought would bring us happiness end up leading us into misery and misfortune. The extra cupcake that seemed like such a good idea leads to the jeans that just won't button. <laughs> the extra TV show that seemed just so innocent and delightful, just a little extra TV and relaxing, didn't clean the house. And somehow it got messier as you were watching that one or just two or three extra episodes, right? Um, ignoring our problems somehow just makes them get larger still. Temptations can be small, like an extra cupcake, or they can be large. 
And we probably all know about the temptations that become so overwhelming and so destructive that they lead to broken lives and broken families, possibly even jail time. Things like lust and pride, greed and gluttony, all of these sins come in small sizes and overwhelmingly large sizes. Temptations are hard to turn away. And I think that's why they're included as a topic, a large topic in the Lord's Prayer. It's what the prayer ends with. So the last several weeks, we've been talking about the Lord's Prayer, how Jesus taught us to pray, that it's good to have a prayer guide that sometimes we feel like we just don't know what to say when we pray, or we don't know how to fill in those blanks, or we wonder perhaps if we're praying correctly. And so the Lord's Prayer is a good guide for that. Several Christian teachers throughout the centuries, uh, people like John Wesley or Martin Luther or many others, have taught us to use the Lord's Prayer as an outline. So not just a prayer to memorize and say, though there's nothing wrong with that, but that there's a lot of richness to those words that we say. And when we pray them as topics and expand upon each of those topics in our own mind, then the prayer develops into a deeper and even more meaningful experience. So we take each of the topics and we think about, for instance, what it means to have God as our Father, or what it means for God's name to be holy. And we pray all of these different petitions, is the fancy word for them, uh, all of these different requests that come up in the Lord's Prayer. And so we've walked through most of them with you in the last two weeks, but the ones that we are left with at the very end is lead us not into temptation and then deliver us from evil. And this is uh, perhaps a difficult one. First of all, there's the phrase, lead us not. It implies perhaps that God might lead us into temptation. And this becomes a really troubling thought. Does God actually lead us? into tempting places and he needs us to pray ourselves out of there? Does God want us to fail? Does God hold out the power of turning our world into gold as just a joke to toy with foolish mortals? Well, I don't really believe, especially that last statement. God does not bring disaster or trial or temptations into our lives in order to toy with us and make us miserable. That's the exact opposite of who God is and what we know about God. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can endure it. And then the Apostle James writes, When tempted, no one should say God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. But we face temptations anyway. We sort of come across these temptations, and sometimes they're our own faults, a result of our own sins, and sometimes they're the result of others who sin against us, as we say in the prayer. Uh, But all the time, these temptations are hard to get over. Uh, Pastor John told me a story about a man named Alvin Ma. He's a motivational speaker, and he was born without arms. His adoptive mother pushed him to uh, continually make his bed and clean his room and do all sorts of other chores. And he found himself wondering as a child, as she pushed and pushed and pushed, if his parents really loved him. But in adulthood, as he was unpacking a memory with his mother, he discovered that his mother would stand in the corner and weep for her son and prayed for him daily. She confessed that being hard on him was the most difficult thing that she had ever done, but she only did it to make him stronger. And so perhaps we consider times of trial or temptation as God making us stronger. But even if that's true, it's still hard to uh, deal with those temptations. It's still hard to say no. I think perhaps it's good to remember 
that Jesus was tempted to, that the temptations are perhaps not in themselves an evil thing. It's just the giving into them that's the bad part. So Jesus had to endure those temptations. Jesus, who had been grounded in scripture and strengthened in prayer, though, was able to recognize what the temptations were and then turn away from them. And very often we recognize that temptations are not on their own often easily recognizable as evil things. The things that Satan offered Jesus were bread and safety and you might say leadership opportunities. Those were not evil things. We want those things too, right? But when Satan offers these things, we pay a high price for them to get them quickly and they cost us our soul. Satan says, here, have a bread, and Jesus says, man does not live by bread alone. And so Jesus is saying that I'm not going to take that which God does not give, because bread without God never fully satisfies. Satan offers Jesus safety by asking him to cry out to God and ask the angels to save him. But Jesus says he will not put God to the test. And then uh, Satan offers Jesus leadership opportunities, all the kingdoms and the realms of the world. And Jesus again says no, because he knows that that quick and easy solution is not the one that God has for him. God's kingdom doesn't come by being prideful and vengeful. It comes through humility and love. And so these temptations, which seem on the face of things like good things, when we add sin, they begin to corrupt us. Jesus knew how to refuse the temptations of the evil one, and we are wise to refuse them as well. Jesus wanted God's way above all else. And so when we pray that God would lead us away from temptation and when God would deliver us from evil, we pray that like Jesus, we may have the power to recognize and say no to those things that tempt us. And instead, pray that God would keep us faithful. And the good news is that God is ready and willing and able to help us in this step. In fact, God is the only one who can help us stick to those convictions and those promises. So we ask God for help and trust God when things get difficult. As we conclude, I want to share one last word from Martin Luther's teaching on the, the Lord's Prayer. This is a portion of his book, The Large Catechism. He says, finally, mark this, that you must always speak the amen firmly. Never doubt that God in his mercy will surely hear you and say yes to your prayers. Never think that you are kneeling or standing alone. Rather, think that the whole of Christendom, all devout Christians, are standing there beside you, and that you are standing among them, common, united petition with God that God cannot disdain. Do not leave your prayer without having said or thought, Very well, God has heard my prayer, and I know this as a certainty and a truth. So this week, let us continue to pray the Lord's Prayer, to let it dwell deeply in us, to pray each portion of it slowly and carefully, and let us never forget to end with a solid and a victorious amen.